Let's now move to just one of those heads. Let's move to general damages, pain, suffering, loss of immunity. Non-pecuniary loss. Let's move to the most important, the 66% of tort damages. What, what are we dealing with here? It's pain, suffering, and loss of function. It's not the financial, it's not the financial costs. It's not the cost of care. It's not for the future pecuniary loss. It's PSLA, as the practitioners talk about. Uh, pain, suffering, and loss of immunity. Um, uh, 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 Anthony Ogus wrote an article in the Modern Law Review back in the 1970s. Anthony Ogus, professor at Manchester until recently. Um, and he wrote an article called A Foot of Function or a Feeling. Um, and it was about tort damages. And it was very good in showing that non pecuniary loss is quite confusing in many respects. There's three elements to it, if you like. The injury itself. Well, that's sort of anatomical loss. How much is a hand worth? How much is a, a foot worth? It's, it's sort of uh, you know, parts of the body, label parts of the body. Your, you know, your, your year is worth how much? Your hand is worth how much? It's the injury itself. And then there's the element of, well, what can you do with that foot? You know, what can you do if you can no longer play football or whatever in stereotypical injuries? The loss of immediate, what were you? What's the function of that organ? which has been a, a part of the body, which is no longer uh, operating. And the final part, the feeling. What about the pain? So it's a combination of all those things. We're going to be compensating you for the injury, for what you could do uh, and no longer do. And we're also compensating you for the continuing pain and the knowledge you are, can no longer play football or whatever. The court, unfortunately, does not divide it up into those three elements. They just give you a global sum. They don't subdivide it. And therefore, it's difficult at times to work out which of those elements are, are the most important. Um, what, what was, what, how much was going to affect? What's going to affect how much you get? Well, how intense is your pain? Uh, um, of course, that's very, very difficult to assess. Uh, um, um, I, 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 I have seen recent work which says it's getting easier to assess. You can attach electrodes to the brain, um, and they will uh, uh, reveal electrical stimuli which shows the extent of your pain if you're asked to move around. Um, how are you, are you limited in, in, in what you can do after you've suffered your accident? How are you limited? We'll get you to wear a Fitbit, as they have done in Canadian cases, uh, and produce evidence of the Fitbit as to how far you move around. Indeed, I saw a uh, TV program just only the other day where, where a whole house had been fitted to see how much the disabled person was wandering and able to wander around. I can imagine more and more electronic, at the very high level of tort, electronic aids to be able for us to discuss pain in a way which we would never have been able to do in the past. And your pain is very different from my pain. I've got a very low threshold of pain. Um, uh, so I want more money. Damages are increasing where, on, where there's a pre-existing anxiety. That's a sort of thin skull or thin psyche sort of situation, mild and grey. But the intensity of pain is very, very difficult. Can you imagine if a judge having to give money for pain and suffering loss immediately? He really doesn't know, does he, what the suffering of the individual is. How much do you understand uh, what's happened to you? Um, if you've only got a limited appreciation of your loss, if you don't really realise what's happened, maybe you should get less. Well, this actually came to court in a case called Western Shepherd in 1964, um, where there was somebody who was called, uh, a, said to be in a permanent vegetative state, a PVS state. Very controversial in the 1960s and uh, very controversial since. I, I went and gave lectures at a hospital in, in, in Putney in London where they, it's a private hospital, and they, they, the director there do, does not believe there's such a thing as a permanently vegetative state. I won't go into that. With the best forms of you know, rehabilitation and recovery, he thinks it's just not true. Um, what, what damages should you get? Well, the defendant lawyer uh, in Western Shepherd, which goes all up the House of Lords, said, well, my, my, the, the, the claimant doesn't know he's been injured. He's completely comatose. He's never going to come out of that state. Why should we give him money for no longer being able to play football and for the pain we don't know whether he's suffering or not? He's just 
a vegetable as far as we are concerned. He's never going to be able to spend that money anyway. He's never going to leave here. He's going to die in this state. I don't think he quite put it, put it quite like that. <laughs> he must have been a bit more human than that. But it was still a fair, that's the sort of argument. Well, why should you get any money? Uh, um, well, the House of Lords in Western Shepherd um, so it was a classic compromise case because they said, well, he should get money for the loss of immunity. He should get money because he can no longer do things with his legs. But he shouldn't get anything for the pain. <laughs> um, it was a, a compromise. They gave him uh, the, the, the compromise sum. The Law Commission and Pearson said uh, in the past that they shouldn't have any money at all, these PBS claimants. Um, but that's never been enacted. They still are able to get money under the rule of Western Shepherd still exists. They still get money for non-pecuniary loss, but not for the pain, but for the loss of immunity. Should age make a difference? I won't dwell on this. Uh, I'll just say, um, well, the law commissions have said that, that, that it should be irrelevant, um, but there's some actually good, quite good authority that, for example, older people, uh, well, you know, it's very sad. You're, you're, you're over the age of 70 now. You're going to die soon. So uh, we don't want to give you so much as the young people like you. So I'm going to be really upset because I'm going to get, get only half the money that you would if I were involved in a similar accident. Uh, the pain and suffering for uh, somebody of my age it's going to perhaps be only half of yours if the defendants got hold of uh, Nut Brown and Sheffield. Those of you studying human rights, yeah. Is that right? Uh, reduced life expectancy, uh, well, um, the, tr the, the, the approach is that you should get more money. If you know you're going to die early, the pain of knowing of your early death, as in asbestosis, for example, where your life expectancy is only two years after being diagnosed, um, should lead to a greater compensation for your mental suffering because of that. Uh, that's reduced life expectancy. Um, you do take into account, fifthly, uh, and this is very important, um, the pre-injury hobbies and enjoyment of life. Uh, you will get more money if you are not a couch potato. If you were a very active person and you had lots of interests and you were very, very physically active as well, you will get more compensation than if you didn't. Um, I've always thought that that could have led to a very much a, a class analysis of, of damages. I always thought that the rich get more because they are able to show that they go skiing or whatever, uh, and the poor are unable to do that. But in the one, the one bit of empirical work I've done on this, I did a study which didn't, didn't actually help me at all. It really didn't prove that at all. So, but you can see the point. You see what we're going to get, get at. Um, uh, sixthly, um, if you have a pre-existing condition, if you're already sick, typically in clinical negligence cases, you're in hospital anyway, you're sick anyway, but you don't get compensation just because you're sick. You only get compensation because the hospital has injured you. So you have to, have to reduce damages because, for example, uh, the, of the effects of an illness which is already there uh, was being treated in a clinical negligence case. Um, and you are expected to mitigate your loss, as you do in tort, in contract. Remember in contract, you... Mitigation of loss? Perhaps you don't. But you're supposed to do, take reasonable steps to reduce the defendant's liability. You're not, you're not allowed to artificially increase the damages. Um, and this was relevant, for example, in the University of the West Indies case, where the claimant unreasonably, the court finds, the claimant which should have taken medical treatment, which would have reduced the injury effect to his, I think it was to his leg, I've forgotten, um, and he unreasonably refused to go under the knife. Um, and the court held that it, that's what he should have done, and therefore his damages would be reduced because he failed to mitigate, he failed to take further measures. Um, loss of marriage and, and prospects and companionship, that, that sounds as though it's uh, a rule out of the ark. Uh, um, in fact, it has cropped up in several uh, cases um, where uh, ethnic minority student, uh, ethnic minor minority claimants have been injured uh, and compensation has been given for loss of marriage prospects. Um, you can imagine in the old days, that was a very sort of sexist head. Uh, women got it and, and by and large men didn't, um, as you can imagine. And the, the law of tort is, is, is not, you know, is, uh, can be objected to from a number of feminist respects. Um, uh, but but one, one, one in particular uh, uh, 
work the other way around. Um, until very recently, until 2017, in fact, um, gender was relevant in that for disfigurement, women, for the same disfigurement, women got more than men. Uh, I, I think that was a hangover of extraordinary anomaly in many respects. Um, and um, one of the uh, Court of Appeal women judges in particular, outside of the court, was very critical of, of that uh, uh, sex discrimination rule. And that discrimination in favor of women was struck out in 2017. Uh, the circumstances of injury. It'll make a difference if uh, you lose a leg as a result of a tra traumatic amputation. Uh, you know, you're involved in a road accident and there's an emergency uh, amputation there, as opposed to uh, going into hospital, in, in, certainly in the old days, but it still happens. Uh, you go for an operation and they actually take the leg off, which is the wrong leg. Things still happen like that, believe it or not, um, but much less frequently. Because that's an, if that's an anaesthetic, of course, it's not as traumatic, it's argued, compared to the road accident. So there are, there's 10 factors which affect the assessment. You can look at those 10 factors. And they're not discussed in, in the textbooks at all, but I'll certainly dealt with much more detail than some of the practitioner works. Um, what's, what's irrelevant? We've got two factors which are irrelevant. Wealth. We do not take into account the claimant's wealth. Although I just suggested to you maybe active people who are very rich who go skiing might be able to get more money. Certainly the rule is wealth is not relevant. So that, for example, we don't give rich people less money because they've got money already. They can look after themselves. No, no, no. They're in the damages like the rest of us. But nor do we give them um, more money because a thousand pounds to them is worth much less than a thousand pounds to me. Uh, um, so wealth is irrelevant in theory, although I've often thought that it's the richer, or better connected people who get into the tort system. And that is certainly borne out by some of the studies, which I shall talk about next semester, about who accesses the raw tort. Right, you never see that stuff in the tort textbooks. Who, acts, who actually gets into the tort system? How the very old and the very young are discriminated against. How men are, are much more in the tort system than women. Certain groups access it more than others. You never see any, no current of the 30 tort textbooks ever consider that. We'll talk about the next semester. And the fact that you're unable to use the damages is irrelevant. Um, there have been a, the odd case or two. There was a case called Lim Pu Chu um, back in the 1980s where it was argued, look, this, this, this guy's he's never going to recover. He's never going to use this. He's, he's, he's not comatose. He's not in a permanent vegetative state, but he's not going to get out to the care hospital. He's, he's not going to give him lots of, lots of money. He's, got no, he's not going to spend it. Not relevant. Give him the money. So inability to use money is not. Well, okay. How do you go about, in practice, sorting out non-pecuniary loss? Um, how do you go about, again, this, this isn't in the books, but it's very straightforward. Um, I, I think in practice, most of your cases are not going to be ending up in court. You're going to be settling out of court. Um, your, own, your own experience is the first thing you'll go on if you're an experienced tort lawyer. Uh, 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 how much a case is worth, you, you will have some knowledge based upon your local experience, hopefully. Or if not your experience, you can, you'll talk to other people in, in the office as to what the going rate is for X or Y, or problems that you have. Um, uh, local practice of insurers, when I, when I was researching in certain areas in the back you know, 20 years ago or so, um, there was a th I was fascinated to go around the country and find how local offices of insurers would differ from uh, other local offices. There could be regional variations in the way they approached and how much they paid. There was a sort of geographical analysis to tort, which is really, really interesting. And no one's ever done any work on that. Um, but barristers' opinions, well, bar yeah, barristers' opinions, you, you, if you, you may need to go to a barrister because you want to get your back covered. Um, um, and maybe some of the barristers will know more about you, the, the law than you or damages than you. 
uh, and certainly they get involved in, in, in damages settlements. But wait a minute, they, they are more likely to be involved in the more serious cases. So uh, as, as, as we were told in, in some of the surveys we've done recently, uh, they may not be very good, for example, at low value cases. Um, solicitors were saying to us, I know the going rate here for a whiplash injury. I know what these boys can get. We're not talking about large sums of money. We don't go to barristers. Barristers never know the final payment. And a few barristers have said to us, we don't know what actually happens in the end because in the end it doesn't come to us. It's settled out of court. It's settled between the solicitors. They may have our opinion on it, but they don't tell us. We don't know. So th those uh, previous settlements are, are crucial. There are books. In contrast to the taught books, there are the practitioner's books. There are books um, and there's court judgments. Here's the key practitioner books, loose leaf books. Um, Kemp and Kemp is the Bible of damages, and the quantum of damages. Loose leaf books nowadays, electronic books, the library all subscribes to these, has electronic versions of all of these. You will get to meet them if you do the solicitor's examinations. Um, students, undergraduate level, don't get to look at these things. There's another key book. And this one here is in particular importance. How the taught textbooks fail to discuss the Judicial College guidelines, I am at a loss to understand. This is a key book. What is, what is, the, what is the Judicial College? It's, it's the College that trains judges. It's made up of judges, and uh, you know, odd academic and practitioners, and they hold you know, updating courses for judges. They train judges. Judicial education, really interesting. Why is it really interesting? Because don't bother with statutes. Forget Parliament. We'll just train the judges. Judicial training is an alternative to statutory reform in some ways. This booklet was started in 1992 on the value of damages. And since 1992, we've had lots of editions. I'll show you in a minute. It's about 92 pages at the moment. It gives the upper and lower limits of pain and suffering and loss of immunity. It's written by judges and practitioners. It is key. It's not a statute. It's not as a result of Parliament. It's judicial training. <sighs> what a fine way of achieving law reform under the table. Um, here it is. The current edition is orange. They have, always have very violent colors. It's 92 pages, as you see. It began with the first edition in 1992. Uh, it, it, it's the four, now in a 14th edition. Um, they increased the damages by 10% in 2013 for reasons I won't go into now. This, one, this is the bit I want you to look at. How much do you think is the maximum you'll get for tetraplegia, for total comatose brain injury? The maximum award is 354,000. Relate your injury to that. You will never get more than that. Well, how much is your injury worth? This is how much. How much is your body worth? Should we have a look? Which bits of the body do you want to look at? This is the, the more gruesome of my tables. Again, I've only, only a couple of textbooks I think have this sort of stuff in it. But there, are, there are a couple. You can see right at the top. 354 is the top for tetraplegia or severe brain damage. Do you want to go down? If you're totally blind and deaf, it's the maximum as well, 354. Paraplegia, 192 to 249. Um, loss of both arms, 211 to 63, 263. Severe facial scarring, 26 to 85,000. What's your fingers worth? Your index fingers, important, 16,000. 13,000 for your middle finger. Your thumb is really important. Thumb is 31 to 48,000 for a thumb. An eye, 48 to 57. Loss of taste, 16. Minor post-traumatic stress, recovery within two years, or loss of your two front teeth. Any rugby players watching this? Three to seven thousand. Minor 
injury where there's complete recovery within three months, one to 2,000. Okay. That's just a summary of 92 pages. <laughs> okay. Um, and you can see, you know, asbestos-related lung cancer, not exactly the nicest thing to have, uh, 61 to 85,000. So that's what your body's worth. It's more detailed than that, the booklet. And here's an example of the greater detail. You can see you'll get between 12,000 and 21,000 for a neck injury. But this is a neck injury involving quite a little bit of injury. Soft tissue, wrenching type, uh, resulting in cervical spondylosis, uh, serious, serious limitation of movement, permanent recurrent pain, stiffness, need for further surgery. So that's the very, uh, well, it's, I think it's the, the, the top middle uh, of, of, of neck injuries. Um, I just took that example out of there. This is not a statute. This is not Parliament. It's got nothing, Parliament has not had an input into this. But soft law, things which go on outside of Parliament, I've always taken a particular interest in the rules which are not technically law, but which affect the legal system. In a whole variety of contexts. Insurance law, in social security law. I've always took an interest in that. I think it's very interesting indeed. It's not a statute, but it's, it's like a statute. Um, in America, they've got special statutes saying how much, what the maximum awards are to be. Here, we don't have that, but we do have the judicial study guidelines. It, 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 you get greater precision from this. Um, mind you, there can be difficulties. How does, if you've got injuries in several parts of your body, how those interact, that, that causes all sorts of uncertainty. What sort of dividing lines are very fine at times? Neck injuries, well, they can be all sorts. So I think there's about seven or eight different classes of neck injuries. Uh, and there's very fine dividing lines between them. So it can be still be very difficult to operate this. There's still a lot of discretion involved, but it's not to be uh, taken as a statute, but these are strong guidelines, which sometimes can be very difficult to operate. In the last five minutes, let me uh, move on to talk about um, a tier perspectives, two a tier perspectives, if, if I may, in the last five minutes. Uh, Atiyah uh, says, um, and I, I, I suffered quite a lot from this in my early career, when I did a lot of work on Social Security law. And I had some old, foggy academics saying, what are you doing messing her up with Social Security law? Um, it's so impersonal. It's not like taught. Taught is awfully impersonal. It's very, very much more individual. Um, and it's true in the sense with Social Security Industrial Injury Scheme, for example, you will get a pension in the industrial injury scheme based on the percentage losses. Uh, if you lose an index figure, it's 14%, and that equates to a certain type of pension. Tord is said to be much more personal, much le more less mechanical. But I've always argued that tort is not nearly so uh, objective as you think. It does involve, uh, uh, sorry, not, not nearly as subjective as you think. It does involve many more objective factors they use the Judicial College guidelines. And as we've seen, they're precise figures in the Judicial College guidelines. They use past cases in textbooks. They use Western Shepherd. You will objectively get money even when you can't feel anything. So it's much more of an impersonal system than they lead you to believe. So a tier is really criticizing the extent to which tort is subjective and individual. He says it's much more objective and much more impersonal and much more of a factory that's what Annette and myself have been writing about recently, is the taut settlement mills, the taut factories which exist downtown. We'll talk to you about that uh, next semester. And he also says this, Atiyah, look at this point. This is a tremendously important point. It is the taut compensation does not put people back in the same position as they were before. It purports to do so, but to a large extent it does not. Okay, if you lose earnings, if you lose this pound coin here, and I give you another pound coin, you've been put back into position. We don't care what the individual coin was. We've replaced one coin with another. That's fine. But when it comes to non-pecuniary loss, if we move away from financial loss, 
what, what are we trying to do when we give you money for headaches, when we give you money for not being able to uh, go skiing or play football? We're not enabling you to go skiing because you'll never go skiing again. It would give you a solace, a substitute comp sort of compensation. And Atia says this is a secondary form of compensation. It's, it's not an exact replacement. It's less important. It's open to fraud and abuse. People will lie about pain and suffering. People can abuse the system. And people will think of it as less important than financial losses. People want their financial losses first. I don't think you go around buying insurance privately. If you had the choice, you wouldn't buy insurance against recover again. For, for pain and suffering losses. And, and if we just take this, 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 this slide into account here, he argues then, too much money is being spent upon a secondary compensation. Too much money has been spent upon non-pecuniary loss, which is two-thirds of the damages award. That figure of 66% crops up here again. So important. Two-thirds of the damages of pain and suffering loss. Does he eventually want to abolish pain and suffering? And the recovery from pain and suffering, which, as we shall see on Monday, to a large extent, I do. Shock horror. My Association of Personal Injury friends think it's outrageous that I should be making such arguments. I don't get much sympathy from students either. So you can see, you can be ready to be upset on Monday when I argue for the abolition of pain and suffering and loss of immunity. And Tia wanted to abolish the whole system for pain and suffering and loss of immunity. In his new additions, he's changed it so that he thinks in the most serious cases it may be justified to an extent. 